When you think of the glory years of Irish football, you are inevitably drawn to the Jack Charlton side of the 80s and 90s that qualified for three major tournaments in a row, beat England at Euro 88 and reached the quarter-finals of Italia 90. The last golden age for the boys in green then came at the 2002 World Cup, when a side flourishing with Premier League stars including Robbie Keane, Shea Given and Damien Duff made the last 16. They may have gone further had Roy Keane not been sent home from Saipan. But in the two decades since, the Republic's talent pool has been shrinking. Thierry Henry's infamous handball aside, they haven't qualified for a World Cup again. Meanwhile, an honest if unspectacular core of James McLean, Shane Long, Seamus Coleman and Robbie Brady have struggled to make a serious impression at the Euros. And recently, things have only got worse. From September 2020, the Republic of Ireland endured a barren run of just one win in 16, only managing to topple the microstate Andorra. Their hopes of qualifying for the 2022 World Cup were then obliterated after a devastating home defeat to Luxembourg, ranked 98 in the world. Football in the Republic has hit a new low. However, change is in the air. In the latest edition of the Nations League, Ireland secured their place in League B, setting up a potential clash with England, while their recent squad contained 10 players aged 24 or under. Stephen Kenny is continuing to blood a new generation of exciting young talent, testament to how their youth teams are beginning to push for qualification at major events. But after years of stagnation, who are the emerging stars getting Irish football back on track? And how is Ireland making sure there will be more golden generations in the future? In this Euro Football Daily Explained, we are crossing the Irish Sea to find out. For well over 60 years, the principal method for developing Irish footballers was exporting their best talent to England. The elite of Ireland's latest group are no exception, including the striker sensation Evan Ferguson. Just 18 years old, the Brighton and Hove Albion forward has only played 10 times in the Premier League but has made a huge impression, scoring 5 goals in all competitions. Form that has seen him fast-tracked into the national team, making his debut against Norway back in November. The teenager's talent was no secret. Son of the former Coventry City defender Barry Ferguson, he made headlines at the League of Ireland side Bohemians, where he first appeared at just 14 years old in a friendly against Chelsea, and three years later, Brighton were beating off Liverpool to his signature. Also established in the Premier League is Nathan Collins. The most expensive player in Irish history, Wolves paid Burnley over €24 million Euros for the 21-year-old centre-half last summer, just 12 months after Stoke City sold him for €14 million themselves. He is joined at Wolves by the 20-year-old Joe Hodge, who is breaking through at the base of midfield. Collins was just 15 when he left Ireland to take advantage of the vastly superior training facilities available in England. It was a similar story for the country's number one, Gavin Bazunu, who was 16 when Manchester City signed him from Shamrock Rovers as was Quivin Kelleher when he joined the Liverpool Academy. Today, Kelleher has made 20 appearances for the Reds as Alisson's deputy, while Bazunu starts for Southampton fresh off his 14 million euro switch to St Mary's. Bournemouth stopper Mark Travers completes Ireland's trio of young keepers battling for game time against the very best. But the Premier League is becoming increasingly difficult to navigate for Irish stars. Despite once enjoying a heavy presence, the increased globalisation of the sport means that last season just 14 Irish players were handed 9,940 minutes of action, a record low. This year, that number could decline further. However, young talent is still entering the top academies or being sent on loan down the football pyramid. Tottenham's Troy Parrott, West Ham's Connor Coventry and Aston Villa's Finn Aziz are all on this path, while the Championship in particular hosts over half of the Republic's latest senior squad, including several future stars. West Bromwich Albion's captain Dara O'Shea headlines this group after recently hitting over 100 appearances for the Baggies. Their most used player this term, the 24-year-old centre-half looks destined for the Premier League with or without the West Midlands outfit. Also joining O'Shea at West Brom is the 23-year-old former Brighton Academy star Jason Malumbi, while over at Norwich City, 20-year-old Andrew Omobamadeli has enjoyed a rapid rise since deciding to leave Dublin for Norfolk before his 18th birthday. Omobamadeli also represents how migration has played its part in growing the talent pool of Irish football. He is just one of many young stars with Nigerian heritage, including Gavin Bazunu, Michael Obafemi and Udinese fullback Festi Ebusele, while Inter Milan starlet Kevin Zeffi has Albanian parentage. Zeffi is interesting in showing how Irish footballers are looking beyond Britain to further their development. In the under-19 side, Ireland has players representing clubs from Sassuolo in Italy to Stade de Reims in France, while their captain James Abanqua joins Ebusele at Udinese. This is partly because many young players struggle to break through in British academies. 
In 2011, it was estimated that 85% of Irish 16-year-olds would not be at the same English club within three years, while 94% of players handed a professional contract at 16 would not get another contract at the same team. But Brexit has also played its part. Players from the EU can no longer move to British clubs before they turn 18, meaning Irish players are now treated on par with South Americans when it comes to accessing the UK market. Now, more than ever, Ireland must take the development of its best potential into its own hands. But as we will explore, this will not be without its challenges. In 2016, the former Ireland and Arsenal star Graham Barrett penned a sobering article for the Irish Times which outlined how, in his opinion, at least 75% of the players leaving these shores are either not good enough or not ready to compete at English clubs. For this to change, association football needs more attention. It may be the nation's most popular sport by participation, but in Ireland, Gaelic sports and rugby union dominate the commercial and public interest. The result is that private investment or government funding in football has been negligible by comparison. In November 2021, Damien Duff stated, The League of Ireland's facilities across the board are horrific when you compare them to Gaelic and attendance figures reflect a lack of engagement in the competition. Just take in 2019 when Ireland hosted the Under-17 European Championships. 2,611 people turned up to watch Spain vs Austria at the Carlisle Grounds in Bray, followed by another 1,737 for Austria against Germany. That same year, Bray Wanderers could only attract an average of 798 people at the same ground. Even in 2022, overall attendance to League of Ireland games clocked in at 172,813, less than the estimated 200,000 who annually travelled to their favourite UK side pre-pandemic. Generating private interest in new stadiums or facilities with limited resources is tough, particularly when there's no guarantee the public will show an interest in the final product. The League of Ireland director Mark Scanlon has admitted there is no quick fix to the issues, but he has put on an optimistic front, saying we want to work with clubs, local governments and central government to improve the standard of facilities over time. What this infrastructure plan will look like, however, will not be revealed until the Football Association of Ireland completes its nationwide audit in 2023. Many believe the FAI is partly to blame for the League of Ireland's deterioration. Under the control of the controversial John Delaney, Ireland's government body racked up debts near 70 million euros, a black hole so deep the Irish government stepped in with a rescue package in January 2020. Although the Minister for Sport hailed the €30 million Euro intervention as a new dawn for Irish football, only in March the FAI requested a further €2.5 million Euros in support, owing to 2023 looking challenging financially. The FAI's relationship with the League of Ireland has historically been strained too. In 2014, Delaney labelled the division a difficult child. However, his resignation in 2019 means the path is clear for the two organisations to put differences aside for the benefit of the Irish game. The FAI strategy for 2022-2025 to has pledged to put grassroots football first. As part of its core six pillars, they will aim to transform football's facilities and infrastructure across the country, nurture football pathways for all, including women, and frame a new future for the League of Ireland. The plan is to have 300,000 registered players by the end of 2025, with an increase of 50,000 female and 28,500 male players. In the words of Shamrock Rovers boss Stephen Bradley, we all need to be in the same room and really put a plan in place to improve what really needs to be improved. It's not about pointing fingers, it's about everyone having grown-up conversations saying, how can we really do this? What's more, the national team's youthful resurgence under Stephen Kenny is slowly creating a domestic appetite for football once again. The 2022 FAI Cup final between Victors Derry City and Shelbourne attracted 32,412 fans to the Aviva Stadium in Dublin. Still only just over 60% of its capacity, but double the number who attended Derry's last triumph a decade ago. The interest is clearly there for football to succeed in the Republic of Ireland, while their latest selection of young stars proves there is still talent to be found. The onus is now on the League of Ireland and FAI to make sure as many players as possible are equipped to fulfil their potential. Get it right and the boys in green may not have to wait too long for the next golden generation to shine through. So that was our look at why the Republic of Ireland are producing so much talent at the moment, but who are your favourite players? Let us know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, why not hit the like button and subscribe to EuroFootball Daily if you haven't already with notifications switched on so you never miss one of our videos. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.